a very warm welcome to everyone to this session where we will explore how to treat our inland waters better, something most of us now know is absolutely vital. Um, I hail from Beaver Trust, where our stated mission is to restore Britain's rivers and wildlife with beavers. One of the things uh, beavers benefit from is space to operate and provide their keystone impacts without coming into conflict with existing land use. But the bigger context here is climate breakdown and the shift in water cycle impacts. So we ought to be acutely aware of increasing flood risk and severity, but also flooding's shady sister, drought. So I recently heard some data around the 24 severe hydrological droughts in the UK since 1900, half of which have occurred since 2010, um, and only two years have escaped severe drought in the last decade. So we need our river systems to absorb more water and release it more slowly, buffering us from the effects of extreme weather, not to mention cleaning up our act um, and doing so really urgently. Adjacent land use has to be part of this resilience building effort, um, and we can only achieve this working together on solutions. So today we have an expert panel lined up for you, including representatives from three out of four of the new Riverscapes partnership. From Rivers Trust, we have Alex Adams setting some context for us, uh, drawing on the 2021 State of the Rivers report uh, and catchment issues being rooted in land use. From Manchester University, with a specialism in riparian um, and woodland ecology and social ecological systems, we have Matt Dennis looking at riparian waterways, how and where we adapt vegetation and the classic problem that nature doesn't always observe political and economic boundaries. From Beaver Trust and the organic Woodland Valley Farm, we have Chris Jones with some insights from the farm on the support that they receive at present and what is perhaps needed to catalyse further change. And lastly, from National Trust, the freshwater environment lead Richard Higgs will outline the Woodlands for Water project, which is the first within the new Riverscapes NGO partnership. And that will lead us into discussion about what this could become. Um, we will run Q&A at the end of the talks, which are 10 minutes each. So please save up your questions for then or post them in the comments and the Q&A. Um, we will collect those in a document and I can um, lead a couple of those at the end for the Q&A session. Um, I'd like to emphasise that the panellists all would like this to be a very interactive session, inviting feedback on the vision presented here rather than this being a this is what's happening, we're telling you as it is. It's very much an opportunity to gather opinion and shape what comes next. Um, so before we kick off, a gentle reminder to everyone to be kind and respectful of all the speakers, please, and each other during this session. Um, and an equally courteous reminder to our speakers uh, to please stick to 10 minutes and I'll give you a one minute um, warning before the end of your talk. So if there's no other housekeeping, I would like to invite Alex to share his slides and kick us off, please. Brilliant. Uh, let me hopefully this... Can everyone see that? I uh, assume you can. Can I have a thumbs up just for another panellist? Brilliant, thank you. So uh, thank you to Eva for the introduction and to you all for joining us today. Um, as Eva said, I'm just going to provide a bit of context in terms of running through the detail. And in doing so, I'm, I'm drawing upon the, uh, primarily from the State of Rivers report that Rivers Trust uh, published uh, last year, sort of autumn last year, but also some of the work by the EA as part of the River Basin Management Plan. So this is really just a context setting session and I'm just going to set my clock so I don't overrun my time. So um, I'm hopeful that many of you, if not all of you, have seen this image before. Um, I use it in pretty much all my presentations. You also notice it on the wall behind me as I put it as a birthday present. But I think this image really encapsulates the importance of getting our rivers into a healthy state. What we do on our land ultimately ends up in our rivers, and our rivers in many ways are an indicator of the health of the wider landscape. Um, and also, and I'm just following on from a previous session, I was at, you know, actually, if we start to think about water and rivers and what we do uh, 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 that rely on those, that actually starts to provide a really helpful focus in bringing all these different policy, delivery, financial implications together. So if we can get our rivers right in an integrated, joined up local way, we will address a whole raft of other issues. 
Uh, and what are some of those issues? Eva's already alluded to it. That we know that you know our rivers are in a perilous state, and things are getting worse, and have been getting worse, really, or at best, sort of static, but primarily getting worse over the last well ten or so years. So water quality status has declined. Only fourteen percent of rivers are in a good ecological status. Over a, a fifth of our water bodies are suffering from unsustainable abstraction. You know, that's primarily in the southeast, but it's across the country. And this is going to become more and more acute as we go think things like uh, climate change and population growth kick in. We all know about this pile of state of our soils. And in some parts of the country, we're losing soils. It's sort of 10 the rate, times the rate it's being created. And a lot of the time, that soil is being washed off those fields into our rivers as effectively a pollutant. So farmers are losing key, key elements of their livelihood and we're also polluting our rivers. Freshwater species are the fastest declining biome of any. Um, that's WWS fact. So freshwater species, and I know that they're not always the glamorous ones, but they are in a perilous state. Uh, with climate change, as already mentioned, we're going to have 10 to 15 percent uh, water and up to 50 and 80 percent water in uh, some rivers in the summer months, particularly in the southeast. Uh, you know, but there's not just the environmental issue, there's the societal issues that has already been heard. So, you know, water, drinking water, water quality, we are kind of there is a big carbon footprint associated with tap water. The more water we use and waste, the higher the carbon footprint, the higher the environmental implications. And equally, you know, and the juxtaposition of the, the, the drought issue is we are also suffering significant drought. So whatever way you look at it, environmentally or socially, what we do with our water and how we look after our rivers affects us all. And it's something that we do, to my mind at least, or our minds, we need to resolve very quickly. Uh, these are some of the bits of data from uh, that went out as part of the EA's River Basin Management Plan consultation earlier last year. And it just gives an indication of some of the challenges that our rivers are facing and in what form. So pollution from wastewater, 35 percent, pollution from farming, 35 percent, physical modification or arguably one of the more challenging things to resolve in terms of uh, river health, 40 uh, percent. And then we, as we move down the catchment, as we move along our rivers, we get into more urban issues, um, uh, changes in natural flow, low level, primarily through abstraction, um, fish barriers, et cetera. And all of these challenges, and they are very real, are only gonna get worse and become more compounded through climate change and uh, population growth. Again, I think yeah. this is a very helpful, albeit slightly alarming slide that's published by the, the EA. If you look at the, um, government's aspirations around a uh, 25 year plan and WFD status and you can just see on this slide about where the aspiration is which is the green line where the kind of reality is if we kind of had stable pressures and if we where we it kicks in if we climate change population growth and there is a significant gap if we carry on on the current trajectory there is a significant gap in terms of delivering the environmental outcomes that have been stated by government so we need to change and we need to change something quite quickly and quite radically i'd suggest Again, a little bit more detail. Um, and again, I would recommend everyone goes to look at the State of Rivers report that's on the Rivers Trust website. These are just some of the reasons for not achieving uh, good ecological status. And this is done by sector. So we can see that the, the forefront is agriculture followed by the water industry. And everyone will be acutely aware of the recent uh, challenges to the water industry around um, you know, sewer, combined sewage outlets. But Primarily, agriculture is the biggest uh, pollutant and the biggest challenger in terms of um, river health in the England. And again, when we get a little bit more granular in terms of the detail, in terms of what those challenges look like, we know sewage discourse uh, discharge continuous. Yeah, you know, a lot of this is driven by the data, and we've got more confidence around the data from sewage outlet than we do from diffuse pollution. So these are just coming kind, of, kind of the headline things: sewage continuous discharge poor nutrient management, which I'm sure everyone's heard a lot about recently, poor livestock management, poor soil management, are some of the major challenges um, that are affecting our rivers and things that we need to resolve. So, and I'm a bit ahead of time, which is no bad thing, but and I don't want to preempt what we're going to cover off later in the presentation, but this slide is what's the, it's the good bad farm slide that produced by the West Country Rivers Trust. I think probably most people who've been working agricultural conservation probably over the last five, 10 years we'd have seen this has been a, a Wells used uh, schematic to demonstrate what good and bad agricultural practices look like. Um, 
And we know what most of these things and how to implement them. It's just a case of how do we do it and how do we do it at scale and how do we do it at pace? One thing that I think is particularly important, particularly relevant, particularly in uh, this day and age, and as we move to the new sort of payment for ecosystem services and ELMS, and we recognise the sort of the challenges around carbon sequestration, habitat um, restoration, climate change, etc., is this opportunity around buffers, margins, and particularly fencing. And how do we create wider wildlife corridors along our rivers to provide all those benefits that they can derive? And on that note, I think that is me done, Eva. Yep, so I shall stop scaring my screen and hand over to me. Spectacular. Three minutes in the bag. Thank you, Alex. That was, that was great context setting. Matthew, Matt. Does that mean I've got 13 minutes? It does. <laughs> Please fill it. <laughs> okay, I might need it. Okay. Uh, I'll just start uh, screen sharing then. I can find it. Okay, so I'm Matthew Dennis. I'm from the University of Manchester, and I'm the uh, principal investigator on a recently funded, UKRI funded uh, Castor project. Uh, we started a few months ago, so there's not a great deal to report, but Chris is on our advisory board and suggested that the what we're going to do on the project would be relevant to this, this session. So I'm going to give an overview of our plans for the next sort of two and a half, three years from three UKRI uh, councils with many institutions and, and partners involved. And um, because of its interdisciplinary nature, it means that like most good ambitious research projects, it's kind of difficult to describe. So I've borrowed a couple of uh, snippets from our, our team and how they've described their own parts of the project. So working with natural functioning riparian treescapes is, is, is one way that we've tried to describe what we're doing. Uh, and it's this idea of bringing back natural processes where, wherever possible. And I think that's what we're most interested in on, on this project. An obvious combination of methods has been used with a healthy dose of sarcasm by some of the team. And when we were writing the proposal, it all seemed to make perfect sense in our own little sort of academic bubble. And I can imagine from the outside, it can seem quite an unlikely arrangement of stuff, really. So I'm just going to go uh, through the main aspects of the proposal. So there are six work packages on the project, and they're connected in various ways. And this is something that we're continually sort of revisiting as we uh, work through, the, through our ideas on the project. So work package one is all about foundations and exploring present and past environmental conditions to identify current opportunities for woodland expansion and to understand some of the ecological and cultural processes uh, that may have been lost from right forward for their, for their management. Work package two is all about water and understanding how water behaves in our case study catchments and how expanding treescapes might affect the, the, the behavior of water and how that results in the various outcomes of interest, how that determines the outcomes of interest, uh, such as uh, water residence times, carbon capture, that kind of thing. Then work package three is about this kind of value dimension. So the goal here is to identify pathways to treescape expansion by exploring alternative approaches to land management through new income streams income streams that incentivize the provision of, of public goods. And reading between the lines there, you can see the word elms, I suppose, yeah. And to do this, we'll be employing, or one of the things we'll do is, is to employ Q methodology to capture different perspectives, and we'll be working in partnership that they have at their disposal. Work package four is about the uh, perceptions, really. And here we'll be using innovative methods from participatory GIS and digital humanities to help people explore how landscapes might have looked in the past, drawing on the work package one stuff, and how they might look in the future using things like virtual reality interventions, uh, participatory GIS, as I mentioned, in the landscape. Uh, speaking of culture, work package five then enters that dimension sort of wholeheartedly. And here the focus is on stewardship and care and how these aspects can be understood through social arts practice and uh, uh, storytelling approaches is one of the methods that we'll be using in this part of the project. So we'll be asking in this work package, what is the role of cultural participation 
and creative practice in understanding and overcoming barriers to landscape change. So it's a very sort of interdisciplinary project. We're looking at uh, various ways of understanding, ways of knowing, basically quantitative, qualitative, cultural, ecological, geographical, all, all these things sort of intermingled together. Uh, then work package six, I just move my uh, camera so I can see it. Uh, work package six then is about the spatial dimension. And here we'll be doing the fine scale mapping work, uh, mapping the trees in these catchments. So this is about assessing the cover structure, uh, connectedness of the existing canopy, and then incorporating the outputs from the other work packages to come up with uh, scenarios representing different outcomes, different emphases for people and nature. Uh, that includes the modeling of the role of ecosystem engineers, such as the species that use that Matt, right area zone. Matt, can I just pause you there? We keep losing you. Can you pop your oh, video? Oh, really? Um, it might help. And then we'll we'll just listen to you instead. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry about that. Anyway, so work package six is about the spatial stuff. That that's my bag. That's my background. I'm a sort of a, a spatial e ecologist, if anything. And uh, so the goal of this work in work package six is to uh, assess the connectivity structure and those sorts of characteristics of uh, tree steps in that riparian zone. And then another part of that is to really upscale what we found. So we'll be uh, taking what we've learned in the catchments and hopefully upscaling that, broadening, extrapolating that sort of uh, those findings to uh, uh, a broader study area. We're focusing on, on Northern England, mainly on the project. Okay, so that's a rather sort of messy interdisciplinary sphere of, of the project. And we'll also be working with some, some key partners and that's where the transdisciplinary work comes in really. So we're working in three catchments. Uh, we're working in the Upper Cone Valley in, uh, in, in West Yorkshire, where I, where I live. And here we'll be working with the National Trust uh, Marsden Moor Estate, which manages a lot of the upper part of, of, of that valley. Uh, it doesn't look like this this morning. It's actually covered in snow at the minute but that we've had uh, come overnight. Uh, we'll also be working in uh, Cumbria, so in the Eden catchment in partnership with the Eden Rivers Trust, and also with the uh, Wild Ennerdale in and around the Lisa and Ian catchments in the western part of the Lake District. We're hoping to and tenant farmers, uh, local residents, artists, activists, and uh, nature conservation agencies. Okay, so beyond the sort of uh, fundamental processes carried out by trees, such as the, the, the carbon capture, the infiltration, the respiration, the things that trees do, uh, we think there's a broader conversation to be had around wood as a material and the presence of woody debris in the environment. So. Uh, as we all know, wood in the landscape represents the keystone process. Yeah, so it does that job of interception, slowing the flow and creating extra complexity in the landscape. So it's uh, it's so useful that we even mimic these effects yeah, by creating leaky dams to slow the flow of water in flood prone areas. And this is an example of such an installation uh, in near Bolton, I think in, in Greater Manchester. But obviously, as we know, there's someone else recently returned to our river systems that's also really good at creating leaky dams yeah so beavers can do a lot of this work of, of, of slowing the flow uh, in a very cost effective way yeah and they can also create more structurally diverse environments and, and help to store water and bring about greater species richness so Modeling the, the impact of uh, ecosystem engineers, not just beaver, you know, thinking about other sort of burrowing animals as well that might uh, be present in the riparian zone. That's one of the key focuses of uh, thinking about how we can bring natural processes back to our riparian uh, zones. And building on some ongoing work on beaver impacted floodplains uh, in mainland Europe, we'll be modeling potential benefits and also potential conflict with existing land use as a result of having these ecosystem engineers return to the landscape. Uh, so the bottom two figures here show some uh, beaver floodplain delineation work that we've been doing, which we've then upscaled and combined with the increase in the landscape as a function of uh, beaver activity. 
And so the, the end goal really will be to come up with a set of tools that we can use to bring all these different findings from the different parts of the project together and identify barriers to and opportunities for uh, riparian woodland expansion that moves us towards the shared, uh, sometimes conflicting, but shared ecological, economic and uh, cultural goals. Uh, so clearly we're trying to navigate a really complex landscape of interacting social ecological processes. And as we work through sort of operationalizing the aims of the project, we're already coming up against a kind of a things that are so common really in ecology and environmental management, I suppose, and probably really familiar to people, people here today. So things like uh, forestry or farming, these are often seen as separate competing land uses, but does that have to be the case? Uh, food or rewilding, again, seen as many, many, by many people as completely exclusive, but is that always the case? Uh, land sparing versus land sharing, how do we coexist with nature at the landscape scale? Do we manage some land more intensively so as to spare uh, land for wildlife elsewhere? Or do we try to share that space often for much lower intensity management uh, approaches? Do we focus on habitat management or do we aim for more dynamic self-willed landscapes where natural processes are allowed back in? Uh, and how do we manage, uh, navigate the fact that uh, those options that are perhaps best for, for climate mitigation are not always the best options for our conservation goals? So there's also some, some tension there. And even though many of these contrasts sort of provide useful starting points, uh, points of departure for discussion, and I find them really useful because uh, they help me to engage students in different types of debate on, on landscape and, and land use. Uh, I'm sure and I hope that many of you will realise that these are in large part sort of false dichotomies, I would say, uh, and that's usually the punchline at the end of a sort of a seminar that I do with students. And particularly in the highly modified landscapes in the UK, they really, they represent, all these things represent a continuum of possible outcomes that we need to acknowledge and work with, I would say. And positioning our, our decisions somewhere along these, these continuum, these continua, in order to achieve the best outcomes for people and nature is gonna re require a lot, of, a lot of cooperation. And I think uh, Eva sort of nodded to that at the start of the session when she introduced us all. And uh, that's it from me. Uh, just, just also to mention, I guess, uh, natural regeneration and planting as well, something that keeps coming up in our uh, 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 research uh, uh, Wednesday morning coffees is, you know, we wrote this proposal and I don't think we actually put at any point that we were going to plant trees or that the project was about tree planting. But every, every bit of media, everything that the university said about the project and you see things on Twitter and stuff, it's about, oh, tree planting along rivers. We never actually said we we're going to do tree planting and we're very open to the sort of a, the idea of natural regeneration again it's going to depend on what our goals are and how we balance those climate and those biodiversity goals and in what context we're working and inside that riparian zone but it's another kind of classic dichotomy that we're, we're coming up against uh, that is it for me i think just to leave you with uh, uh, our beautiful uh, project team who are very uh, cooperative bunch and i look forward to the next sort of two or three years of working with them and Chris of course who's uh, uh, heavily involved in the in the project so far that's Matt, it for me thank you for that brilliant brilliant you're just within time with the extra really excellent. That's perfect um <laughs> so Chris is up next and he has just disappeared from our screen Chris are you still with us and if not can I invite Richard to take his place while we oh Chris hang on we've got Chris so next, Chris from Beaver Trust and Woodland Valley Farm in Cornwall. OK, Richard, you, have you got your slides ready? We might go on to that if that's OK. And then we'll come back to Chris at the end. Yeah, I can do that, Eva. Super. I'll just, uh, OK, that will stop Matthews. Lovely. Um, OK, thank, thank you um, to Alex and Matt and Eva for giving that, um, that introduction. I'm uh, Richard Higgs from the National Trust. I'm the Water Programme Manager. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the uh, Riverscapes Partnership um, and our first funded project, which is called uh, Woodlands for Water. Uh, so Riverscapes is 
Uh, it's a partnership between uh, the Rivers Trust, uh, the Woodland Trust, Beaver Trust and the National Trust. Um, so they're the core partners, but we also have a broader coalition of supporters, including water companies, uh, other NGOs and, other, and others in the sector. So there is quite a broad coalition that is uh, also in, involved in this. But we felt that the, the, the four NGOs actually represent quite, a, quite a, a powerful coalition and partnership, hopefully, that we can really, really make a difference. Because we've already heard from Alex um, that there is a, 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 a huge challenge that we are, we are facing into, which is, uh, which is what, why we came together. Um, so I, I make no apologies that we, we have a, a, very, uh, a very broad an ambitious vision, which is about creating uh, a nature recovery network along our rivers by 2030, which is it's partly about native tree establishment, but it's also about habitats, uh, mosaics of ha habitats that will bring about multiple benefits within catchments. Um, and we'll do this by finding solutions to that systemic challenge um, through creation of a model that is simple that's really key um, and it was one of the things that we we talked about right at the start that we wanted to find a, a, a solution that was simple at the point of contact for landowners um, but then also for, for financiers to bring that blended finance in into this because it, it is it's complex and it's um, and, and it's actually really difficult. And uh, I've heard a number of times from um, some of the best professionals in the industry who've said that it's, it's really difficult to crack this problem. So that's what, what we've come together to, to try and do. So a little, little bit more detail on the, uh, on, on the ambition. Um, 100,000 hectares of land, 25,000 kilometres of river, rivers by 2030, creating that network of riparian habitat, wildlife corridors and, and buffer strips is, is what we need. And that is our, that is our really key aim. Um, this is about transformational systemic improvements around whole catchments. We talk quite a lot about about buffer strips along rivers, but it, actually it is also a, a whole catchment price, uh, based approach. Um, it's about advocating benefits with with farmers and landowners about this this approach. It's definitely about practical implementation of nature based solutions. Um, it's about capability and capacity with, rele with relevant stakeholders in the in the sector. Um, it also includes the development of a blended fi finance mo model. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and it's also about using the, the skills and experience of the, the, the various partners that have come, come together with this. So that's the... That's the broader partnership known as Riverscapes. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing over the last, last year really is working very closely with DEFRA on how we, how we might secure some funding to actually make this happen. And the, the first bit of funding that we've received from DEFRA is for a, a project called Woodlands for Water. This is specifically targeting um, woodland creation, and that includes uh, na natural regeneration. It's not, it's not just about uh, planting trees, it's about natural regeneration. Um, it's about using the new England woodland creation offer that is known as UCO. Um, it's actually a, it's a very generous grant um, it, is a, it is a grant that does include some open land, it includes natural regeneration, and it includes a number of payments for uh, infrastructure and other things that are needed to actually de develop that, as I say, that sort of uh, mosaic of habitats that we're, we're looking for. Our, our target for the next four years is 3,150 hectares. And um, we have also picked out what we've called Pathfinder catchments, where we're going to going to start that work. Um, 
alongside the UCO offer, so the grant, we are also working on a, a simple carbon offer. Um, those of you involved in carbon will probably not put those two things together, the word simple and carbon, but um, our aim is to try and find a way of offering something that is understandable and simple for landowners, which actually is a, is a really, really great incentive for people to, to sign up to it. So the, um, the, the places that we are, we're, we're working, um, we're starting off um, in North Devon, the Torridge and the, and the Tor. Um, and in each of these catchments, one of the organizations is, is take, taking a lead, but it's actually working with all of the partners and with all of the, um, the other partners in those, those places. So it's very much working with existing partnerships in those places. So in North Devon and Somerset, Somerset is the, the National Trust who are the lead. And then in the South Devon um, and Cornwall catchments, specifically the Tamar and the Foy, it is the West Country Rivers Trust. Um, we then have a number of catchments across Norfolk, um, which has been led again by the Rivers Trust. And you can see those catchments there covering quite a, a large area actually. Um, then also in the, the Y and the Usk, specifically the, the Door, the Dulles and the, and the Lug and the Y and the Usk Foundation are working across there. Um, it's probably a, a, a good point to note that um, at the moment, the Woodlands for Water project is looking specifically at England because it's using uh, funding from DEFRA via the English Woodland Creation Offer. But the ambition of the partnership is definitely to work here across the UK and our, our next steps will most likely be in Wales but we're also looking at Northern Ireland and Scotland as well but um, the, the broader ambition is certainly not, uh, not, not just in England but um, I'm sure many you'll know that the UK is only available for, for England. Um, also working in Cum Cumbria and the Derwent, the Oldswater catchments, which includes the Petrol and the Eamon subcatchments and the West Country, uh, sorry, West Cumbria Rivers Trust and the Eden Rivers Trust are leading in that catchment. Um, and then also the Seven catchment and the team, which again, the, the Rivers Trust are working. The, and the Rivers Trust have a... Um, a, a they taking the lead in the work on the ground because they, they they're already doing that. They are, they're well established a long time. The Woodlands for Water project is giving a bit more um, a bit more power to our our elbow as as, as such to um, make things happen in a larger scale and and faster. Um, I'll just go back to that. The, the other area that we're focusing on is the National Trust are also focusing across our whole England estate. So, you know, we have uh, huge ambitions for woodland creation. So we will be using the UCO payments to create riparian uh, woodland, woodland creation where we can across the, uh, our, our English estate. So our, our next steps, we, uh, we secured the funding um, towards the end of last year um, from DEFRA and, um, you know, DEFRA have been hugely uh, supportive and uh, we've, we've been working with um, all of the arm's length bodies on this and we have a, you know, a very close dialogue with, with them on the, on the project. So it's, it's great to have developed that way of working uh, with, with DEFRA. Um, we are currently engaging with stakeholders in the, the various catchments uh, and that graded approach. Um, we see one of the huge risks with this is that it's uh, not going to provide simplicity, but it will, um, it will, will confuse with what we don't want is uh, somebody else walking up the farm track with, a, with another logo on their, on their jacket. This is very much working with existing uh, stakeholders and partners and NGOs who are working in those places, adding a little bit more uh, resource to make, making this happen. 
Um, we've started to develop the carbon model and the Woodland Trust. Are One minute, on Richard, that. if you would. Thanks, Eva. Um, we're also developing a tree hub, which the Rivers Trust are, are leading on, which will be a, a sort of one-stop online shop for all, all things to do with grant funding and how, how you can access funding for riparian tree planting. Um, we're recruiting the, the teams and actually done very, very well, and we've got most of that in place now, and then developing the pipeline of projects. And then the last point, the development of the riparian nature recovery network, that, that is the, the, the broader um, and bigger ambition that the partnership has. And um, so this is, it's really just a start. Um, the Woodlands for Water is focused on, on trees and woodland creation, but we see this as a way of actually starting to, to get into finding a solution, that systemic solution to the challenges that we're facing into. And Alex, you know, very clearly out, out, outlined those at the, at the start. So a little bit there on the tree hub. I'll, um, I'll skip over that. I'll leave that up just for a few seconds. So do make a note if you want to get in touch with anybody on the, on the project. Um, we're very much want, wanting to, to hear from you. Um, and we want to we want to make sure this works. You know, we want to make sure this is actually scaling and accelerating the creation of that riparian uh, nature recovery network. That's that's what it's all about. And we're about we're about learning by doing. We're about demonstrating. And we're about scaling and accelerating to to face into those challenges. So, um, you know, and we're we're here to facilitate that not lead on it we're here to work with others to to make that happen so i will uh, leave it there eva thank you thank you that's great a lovely introduction to the riverscapes partnership and we'll look forward to questions on that later i think we've got chris back now chris if you'd like to share your screen and take it from here okay thanks so much uh, everyone um i uh, was supposed to be talking before richard uh, uh, and, and now suddenly I'm, I'm uh, tail end Charlie on, on all this, so it, I, I hope it sort of makes some kind of coherent sense. Um, I, I'm really wanting to try and talk here today about uh, what this um, kind of thing means to me as a, a small farmer and, and what I would like to see. So anyway, here we go. Right. Just to uh, really put some context, um, this I won't dwell on this too long. This uh, graph here shows the um, increase in farm income uh, since 1947 uh, till more or less the, the turn of the century and the decrease in um, profit over that period. Uh, and it, it's just showing really that, that uh, um, we've put more and more and more stuff on our land and spent more and more money on stuff. and. Uh, the, the cost has been to our environment and society. Um, I won't dwell on that anymore just now. Uh, there's a whole lecture in, in this slide alone, but we, we uh, haven't got time to mess around with that. Right. Who, who am I and what's my creation of interest here? Right, first of all, um, I'm a director for, uh, of community and land at the Beaver Trust, and I'm also part of the Riverscapes partnership and hopefully developing more interesting things than just uh, the Woodlands for Water programme as we go on. I found a member of the PFLA um, and I'm the co-owner with Lloyds Bank of Woodland Valley Farm. Very typical Cornish farm, grade three land, me medium silty clay loam, um, jointly owned by me and Lloyds Bank. And we are a very highly diversified business, which if we go back to the previous slide today, if you want to be profitable, you've got uh, only a few options. One is to get much, much bigger. One is to be very, very specialised. And the other one is to be uh, highly diverse, I would uh, posit. Okay. Um, something that, that has been going through my head for a long time now, uh, and it's partly been um, responsible for the diversification of, of our income streams, uh, is what does our land do for us? And uh, particularly through working with children, actually, we began to see our land as being very a very, very different thing than just a unit for producing food. So for example, it gives us nice clean water and it gives us a, a degree of water regulation, which of course is not so important for us, but very important to communities downstream. 
Um, it's a great place for uh, collecting carbon. Um, we are probably, if uh, our figures from farm carbon cutting toolkit are correct, we're probably sequestering around about 350 tons a year, year on year. Um, uh, our land has to provide good habitat for uh, diverse and abundant wildlife. And it's got to be good for society as well, etc. There are lots and lots of these. If we sit down with school kids and, and exercise this out, we end up having somewhere it, it, uh, above 10 really useful things that land does for us. Uh, just to talk about water a little bit more, this, of course, is absolutely fundamental to our life support. So we better bloody well look after it. If you have a glass of water on this farm, it will have been filtered through our farm, uh, th through, through the soil that we sit on and do our farming on. So, uh, and this pretty much goes for everyone everywhere in the country. So we need to look after land in order to look after the water. What are we going to do about it? Right, so we've got to stop poisoning our waterways overall over the country. This is, um, uh, you would think, a very easy and basic um, aspiration, but far more observed in the uh, ignorance of it than the actual observation of it. We need to restore the ecological function of our waterways. Again, very easy to say, but uh, uh, very rarely is this actually being done in any meaningful sense. We've done a little bit of it here. Uh, we're a headwater of the Trezinian River, which is in turn a, head, uh, a headwater of the River Fowl. And by the application of a small number of beavers, we've gone a very, very, very long way to restoring that ecological function. We should remind ourselves that um, uh, in terms of ecology, our headwaters need to behave much, much more like big rivers. Um, but we also need to create buffers to protect them. I don't care how well we have the actual ecological function of the waterway, right? If we're not protecting them from um, uh, or slowing down surface flow uh, and uh, buffering them from undue chemical influences, then we're just wasting our time. What do we need? I think we need a very, very clear steer from, from government uh, uh, through a variety of uh, grant or ELM, um, and lately through some bits of, of uh, um, farm stewardship, we've been having some of that, but we do really need a, a, a clear, a clear uh, steer. Woodlands for Water is a very good step in the right direction because it constrains us into banning uh, mainstream agriculture from our uh, immediate um, uh, uh, waterway. It has a minimum of 10 meters, which I personally think is inadequate. We should be more like 20 meters um, uh, and potentially in some places more than that as well, but uh, at least a good step in the right direction. My doubts about it are that um, typically, if we're talking about establishing woodland, we're talking about excluding everything else. And uh, I, I don't see there's a habitat uh, in, the, uh, in, in Europe, uh, which, is actually really fully functional without some large mammal impact. Um, we need a really clear intellectual framework. Uh, our schools and colleges are pretty bloody useless on this. Um, uh, you know, what colleges are really talking regenerative farming? What colleges are really talking uh, about ecology? The time has come for this. And it, because if the average, and I mean the average, uh, a farmer on Anna do doesn't understand what is going on with our ecology, we're stuck. Um, and we need, I would posit, as a simple farmer myself, I think we really need to have simplicity in application and execution of these things. And I'll go through what we've been doing here in a moment, um, because we've adopted uh, uh, the higher tier stewardship that um, I'm going to go through in a moment. And this has not been a simple process. I could speak at some length, much more length than I have here, uh, about the uh, unduly prescriptive and uh, Byzantine way of actually achieving what in the end I think is probably quite a good, uh, a good um, a scheme, um, but has involved actually fighting with Natural England, who rather should be really backing us to the hilt that. Um, more about that later in Q&A if anyone's interested. So this is uh, our farm, all the nicely coloured bits in the middle. Um, I don't know if people can see my cursor. Uh, oh, back, 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 back. Uh, 
you can see my cursor, um, that the stream that we have runs down approximately like this, following my cursor through the beaver site and away and away off to the sea. Okay, now I wanted to have uh, river buffers paid for. And it turned out that through um, the uh, BPS, there was nothing in place to do that. Um, and in terms of high tier stewardship, uh, there were, were routes to it, uh, particularly through creation of scrub and taking small areas out of management. Note nothing in there, whatever, about buffering streams, but we've managed to adapt what they wanted to, to uh, uh, have the, the the scrub creation and the small areas out of management, and we've uh, adjusted those uh, in the different field parcels such that we have achieved the buffering that we wanted to do. Uh, but we had to really, really think laterally about that. And uh, we had to fight with naturally to get it. Now, the, the, the trouble is as well, because it was going to be a whole farm scheme, we then had to think of other things that we wanted to do that made coherent sense in all this um, uh, and get those in as well. And we've done that uh, through the creation of wood pasture. And uh, to cut a long story short, that was bloody difficult um, because we had different ideas about what that wood pasture should look like to natural England and there, objections to what we wanted to do were based on aesthetics, i.e. they wanted something to look like um, capability Brown had just been through, and we wanted to do something which would achieve the same, or if not better, wildlife and, and uh, uh, ecology outcomes, um, but be able to farm as well at the same time in a, in a reasonably efficient way. And having trialed 15 acres at, at our own expense, we thought we had the answer, um, and uh, it took us, I have to say, nearly a year uh, uh, arguing and fighting with natural before eventually um, someone said, yeah, actually, this will lead to better wildlife outcomes. So we got the backing for it. Um, would I have done this with um, uh, Woodlands for Water? Yes, if Woodlands for Water had been there uh, 12 months earlier than it has been, I probably would have, but um, I, I I'm not entirely sure it would have been quite as flexible as, as we wanted. Um, in our particular instance, as you can see from the, the, the uh, uh, photograph there, we already have quite a lot of woodland on the farm. Um, and my contention is across much of the country we probably have quite enough woodland. What we don't have is enough trees and uh, agroforestry. If, if there's something we really need in this country now, it is an agroforestry scheme, which is simple, easy to get into, get into and universal and no questions asked, let's bloody get on with it because that will provide us with a, a massive amount of, uh, of uh, positives and I would posit very few negatives. Okay. Um, your time's drawing to a close, I'm afraid. Okay, th well, I was just gonna say, I don't know if I've got any more time left. Um, the, the last slide is very boring, it's just a slightly blown up version of that. I will say no more at this stage, but standing by for big bats and or approbation as, as we go. Thank you very much indeed. And can I just finish off very quickly by saying the, the, the partnership that exists now with Riverscapes, I think is a really good one. And uh, we need to be much, much more working across different interests and across different disciplines to get sensible, coherent ecological solutions. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, really interesting to see a working example of this. So we've got loads of questions coming through on Q&A and chat, which we'll try and um, coordinate. Um, we, I, will, I will pick a few of those to start with. If your question doesn't come up and you want to raise its urgency, please post again um, if you think it's a really important one and we're missing it. We've got about half an hour um, for questions. So if the panel would like to unmute themselves, um, we will start with uh, a, a common question actually, is how we start to link some of this with the Environment Agency or NRW and, and are they present on this conversation and how, um, 
Anne Robbins asks, I love the carrot approach of the Riverscapes project as outlined by Richard, but is there also a need for sticks? Is Riverscapes partnership working with the Environment Agency on improving the regulation of waterways? And, and I think there's an interesting question there in how we can bring agencies along with us as we um, develop this programme. Richard, do you want to look at that first? Uh, yeah, no, it's a good, it's, it's a good question. And um, uh, yeah, yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, I've, I think it's a good question, actually, the sort of carrot and stick approach. So, um, I mean, I think each organisation, I know certainly um, Rivers Trust and National Trust, we already work very closely with the Environment Agency. And I think this partnership has actually given us a, it's, I think it's given us a way in and it's given us a slightly light, louder, more powerful voice with um, DEFRA's at arm's length bodies. So we, we will use that. Um, I mean, it's not a, it's not a prime, a, objective of the partnership around changing regulation but having said that changing regulation is a it is, is one of those things that will really make the difference so I I think you know we've been working on a, a broad ambition we've secured funding for a first project but our, our next steps are continue with that broad ambition and working with arms length bodies and particularly the environment agency is yeah absolutely on the agenda I mean Alex might want to uh, add to that I'm not sure. yeah well uh, thanks Richard that's really helpful I, I think trying to break the question down into some constituent parts I think the carrot ultimately we do need elms to kind of be you know front and center and help them drive this forward this the, the principle be it 10 meters or 20 meters we need it to be baked into elms and we then need to be able to stack the various other benefits and the finances on top of that and I think that's absolutely critical and to my mind you know, you look at the 25 year plan, you look at the local nature recovery strategies, etc. They're all good, but they do miss a kind of unifying coherence in terms of the geographical framework. And they miss the in large parts. They seem to miss the Lawton's more joined up element. And this goes a very long way to achieving that. So they, I think there is a policy requirement. Picking up the point about regulation per se, um, it's not the focus of the partnership. There is quite a lot of good work going on around that, both in the uh, England and um, UK. Somebody's got very noisy something going on. Um, uh, and actually, I think some of the recent press releases around uh, what's been going on in the Y with uh, poultry manure and that cross-border issues. There was a commitment, I think, yesterday for greater regulatory alignment between EA and NRW. So things are happening on that front a bit more slowly than we'd like. And then in terms of the projects for Woodland for Water, one of the absolutely critical first steps is bringing all the stakeholders together. And that includes the EA, FC, NE, CSF, national parks within that local area to really start to try and understand who's doing what where so we can align and sort of be more integrated in delivery. Because to be honest, it's a bit of a bugger's muddle out there at the moment. And so one of the first steps, and we've done them for a number of the pilot areas, but not all yet, is to get that local network to understand who's doing what, where. And so we can, so we're not tripping over each other and we can maximise the impact as best we can. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, related to that, and I hope that answers the questions, um, please, please add further clarifying questions in the comments if it doesn't. Um, related to that, Someone asks, should all should government bodies just enforce buffers to all fields and rivers um, along Reside rivers as urgent action? Now, this is an interesting question. I think we can expand that to sort of say, what are the challenges to introducing river buffers um, through this partnership? And how do we make sure we bring along uh, land managing communities with us so that enforcement doesn't just trigger a rejection of the concept? Chris, do you want to look at that? Um, enforcement idea to start with. Uh, uh, yeah, just just uh, really briefly, water is uh, one of the very few absolutes that we have to look after, uh, and it's not just because uh, of of uh, the pollution thing or, or or the flooding thing. It's everything, including drought, which uh, we tend to skate over very quickly in this country, but it's increasingly becoming a thing. So, um, for me. I would make it absolutely compulsory that uh, there are um, uh, river buffers, but they need to be paid for 
well, so that uh, it takes a sting out of the compulsion element. And I think also we need to be uh, having a very uh, broad view of what buffering means. Um, I, for me, it means taking away um, uh, your cultivation and chemistry and allowing only natural process uh, to be uh, going on within it. So it wouldn't necessarily mean um, um, a, a compulsory removal of all livestock influence, for example. Um, you know, a, a grazing by large mammals is a totally natural process, um, but you've got to have a moderation uh, and, and common sense applied. And of course, that's where difficulties come in. Yes. Richard, could you similarly answer the question, but also mix in how are the National Trust bringing their farming tenants along with the existing riparian trees project? I think the two relate. Yeah, so no, I, I, I agree with I agree with Chris. Um, I mean, I think the one the one thing to remember is that we're we're looking for long term sustainable solutions to this. So what we actually want, as, as Chris has said, is that we want the right the right payments paid in the right way that are simple to access and if we i think if we do that and if we crack that then then land, land owners and land managers will will take them up and we will create buffers and riparian networks that everyone can see the benefit in so i think a, a sort of a a, a short-term um, approach of, of stick of making it happen could, could actually backfire. What we want is landowners to see the benefit, but in both in monetary terms, but also in terms of nature and access for benefits for people. And I think if we can do that, and, and actually it's not hard to paint a picture of what the benefits are for nature and people. I think actually everyone is signed up to that. I think it's just making the right the right payments to make make that happen. And then it will happen. I think I think it will, but it's it's simplifying and it's getting the right the right financial incentives in into it so that we can make make that happen. And you know, and that's the way we work with our tenants. You know, it's um you you have to. It's 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 not a case of do or don't. If you want to actually achieve um change and particularly landscape scale change and change to 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 farming and practices and benefits for nature you know our farmers are, are the people who are managing that land so we we have to work with them and we you know we are we are starting to see some real success with that and you know we we've, we've been we've been doing it for years but we we are in a time of change that's that's difficult for ev everyone i'm not going to i'm not going to say there aren't tensions around that um, but by finding the right the right incentives and we've we've just recently i put in the chat we've just recently planted a quarter of a million trees this winter through money from green recovery almost all of that or a, a big proportion of that has been on our tenants land and creating um, wide um, hedgerows and you know that's been done in conjunction with our farmers and there's been good payments for it so the incentive was was there and people are seeing the benefits of what's happening on the land in, ter in terms of nature so it's yeah it's it, it it it's two ways but we need to think about the long-term sustainability of this and everyone seeing what the benefits are and paying the, the right maybe the, a fair price for it because farmers are you know they're, they're running businesses Mm. Mm, thank you. Coming to you, Matt, in terms of people understanding what the benefits are, there's a, there's a lovely question here about there may be a lot of land use change before the results of your project. Do you think, how, how will you balance that? And do you think that your um, research and your project could have an influence here, both to government and to um, helping landowners understand the potential of systemic change? Well, it, it's true. And, you know, there's, um... There's a lot of work. Oh, hopefully we'll get Matt back in a minute. In the meantime, can you can you hear me? Okay? Oh, here we are. Yeah, you're back now. Okay, I'll try. I'll try yeah. and be brief then. But that's a, a, a relevant concern. So things are going to happen whilst we're working on the project, and land use change is, is one of them. But it could be a good thing for us as researchers because a lot of the stuff we'll do. Nope, that's not working for us. Okay, 
not to worry. Let's see if your connection comes back a bit better shortly. Um, Ian Davis asks, how do we manage the issue of land value when productive agricultural land is rewilded either by design or by the default action of beavers or through um, river buffers and enforcement and, or option uh, opt in? Who would like to take that question, issue of land value? I think Chris would like to answer that probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, land, land value, uh, it, 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 if we're talking about agricultural land, is an extraordinary subject, which um, I, I can't pretend to really understand because it never seems to bear any resemblance at all to the money you can make out of it through farming. Um, uh, there are so many factors involved in it that it, it's really, really hard to unpick in my view. But I would uh, say that um, the uh, recent um, enthusiasm uh, for uh, rewilding uh, and for offsetting um, seems to be helping uh, very well with um, supporting uh, 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 land value. And I would posit as well that um, as the climate um, and ecological crises uh, increase, uh, there will be, um, there, there's not going to be any slackening in, in, in the value of land at all, whether it be under uh, uh, trees or, or scrub with some grazing or whatever. I just cannot see that happening. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 um, I, I actually look forward to a day when agricultural land does bear a resemblance to um, land value. And in the, the end, high land values don't actually help us very much because farms can't afford to buy the bloody stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, anyone else got anything to add to that before we? Uh, I would agree with Chris, if you could hear me. Uh, and it's, we have to question, you know, what and how we value uh, land and what land does, I think, you know, and as Chris alluded to, if there's a, if we can capture that zeitgeist of people actually wanting to value different types of services other than say just just food or, or forestry or, or whatever, then we need to capitalise on that. And I'm not convinced either that land value is going to plummet. It never has done really before. So land's still the best thing to own as far as uh, uh, trying to make a living is concerned. Thanks, Matt Richards. Yeah, I mean just. Just a quick point, I would say what, what we need to think about is the value of the land function, not the value of the land per se. And, you know, and I think I think that is heading in the right direction. OK, thank you. Much nodding among the panellists there, land function. Um, right. Thank you. Good question. There's a there's an excellent question on fencing rivers. So this is really, really pertinent to the river buffer um, conversation and land function. And, and uh, so the, the um, question relates to suggesting it's not an answer unless we want succession to scrub woodland, heavily shaded watercourses, no water bowls and no lightly poached margins for vertebrates. Can we look at panelists? Can we look at the fencing issue um, in how we integrate buffers with existing land use. Matt, it would be great to hear your view of some of the ecological social dimensions here and, and Alex, perhaps some of your experience as well from the Rivers Trust work. You must have come across the fencing challenge um, a few times. Yeah, I think when it, when it comes to fences. Oh. <laughs> those sort of management goals are, yeah. So uh, often, from a conservation point of view, fencing is used to exclude grazing for, for whatever reason. And if that's what the management goal is, then I can see sense in that. I can see that. But if we take a more compositionalist view and we are just looking at, say, water bowls or certain types of vegetation, then maybe fencing isn't, isn't the right way to go. But I do think it would be context specific and that's something we need to get really on board with, that a lot of the answers, solutions will be context specific. And we can't just say fences are good or fences are bad. Yeah, I think that's what we need to sort of try to start getting on board with. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, I think uh, Matt's point about it, you know, 
right fence in the right place for, for to, to stretch it uh, is is absolutely spot on. Obviously, from a kind of water quality perspective, you want to keep livestock out of rivers. They are kind of key pollutants. They break river banks down. They kind of feces, urine, what have you. So you don't want you, you fencing is the most appropriate way of keeping them out of the, the rivers. Uh, Equally, we know that there are issues with fencing in terms of landscape value. So uh, um, my previous life at Natural England CSF, you get into these rather abstract conversations where people would say, well, we want to put fencing in to keep the cattle out, but actually that would have an impact on the landscape, kind of the, the visual impact on the landscape. So there are always these compromises and challenges that need to be accommodated at the local level. But, you know, from my perspective, keeping livestock out of rivers is good for the rivers and actually good for the livestock as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, th that's my stance on that. Thank you. Anyone else got anything to add to that? In the panel? Yeah, um, just very quickly, we fenced quite a bit of our stream off as a scheme that was backed very well by the West Country Rivers Trust uh, about 20 years ago. And um, it has done exactly what we probably didn't need to happen which was to completely shed out the river very very dense bramble growth and so on and and um it's in this sort of a, ba a bad a bad pay place uh grazing is an entirely natural uh, phenomenon some uh, 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 large mammal impact on on a river and the banks is not a bad thing yes i know every, every cow pack that falls in the water is uh uh perhaps unwelcome, um, but it is a natural thing. So perhaps we shouldn't be too dismissive of it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, a question direct to Matt about your research. Has work program, work plan six, not already been largely covered by the mapping for natural flood management done by Dr. Burgess Gamble of the EA and Jacobs? So I think yeah, well, I was, I was just having a look at that while uh, you were, well, the other presentations were happening because uh, Ian kindly put the link into the chat. Um, I've had a look at it. Yeah, they do seem to do a lot of work on opportunity mapping. And they're not the only ones that have done a fair bit of work on opportunity mapping for woodland. Uh, I guess what we'll do in addition to that is look at the uh, predicted uplift in terms of carbon sequestration, connectivity for different types of species with different different dispersal capacities and that have different sort of impact on the floodplain when, when they're present and when they're moving through the landscape. So I guess we're doing something similar and this might provide a useful baseline if they wanted to hand over the, the data. But uh, we'll probably do you know our own version and then we've got other questions to do with uh, connectivity, to do with uh, water residence times, this kind of thing that we'll do in our case study catchments and then try to extrapolate beyond that. But yeah, certainly something that we need to, to look at because what we don't want to do is replicate anything that's already been done, of course. Super, thank you. Uh, while I think of it, is there anywhere that you can stick in the chat that people can follow your research? How, how will they find out more about it? Is there a- oh, Yeah, we do have a Twitter handle and a web page, so I can put links to those in. Super, thank you very much. On a related research note, uh, there's a question, is there any focus or study on the eel salmon trout populations as an outcome? Now, I don't know whether that relates directly to your research or to our Riverscapes partnership, um, but it is an interesting thing to look at. Alex, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, and so in terms of Woodlands for Water, as Richard's already alluded to, what we're, this is we're adding another tool to the existing box. We're not reinventing a wheel. We're trying to stack up, provide things that are on projects that are already happening on the ground um it's sort of another tool in the box something complimentary um i without fully understanding the context of the question what we're doing around woodlands for water or, or one of the benefits will hopefully be, be, be benefits will be um uh keeping rivers cool in terms of samurai populations particularly with climate change you know river temperatures are going up and in some parts of the country and in some particularly was it last summer we had a really hot summer they were going up extortionately or it's considerably, and that will have a kind of potentially fatal impact on salmonoid populations, be it salmon, trout, what have you. So actually adding that shade to rivers is going to be a critical part of, um, of what we're doing. And it's actually one of the things that UCO scheme supports. Um, the monitoring of that, 
although that's not baked into the program, certainly for a number of the work that's going on the local rivers trust, that will get picked up as part of the wider citizen science as part of the wider restoration work that is going on. But it's not sort of embedded, baked in as part of a monitoring requirement for the project, not least because we just don't have the budget to do that. Thank you. Matt, anything else on, in terms of your research? Uh, well, I had assumed that that question was uh, going to be about beaver dams, actually, and blocking uh, migration paths. And uh, yeah, it's hotly debated, and there's mixed evidence in the literature. There are just, but what I personally think is that both uh, beavers and uh, salmon and other species of fish have co-evolved over millennia, and they've managed just fine without our intervention. So I do think that uh, it's not all is lost sort of picture when it comes to migrating fish. There's no hard evidence that it's a problem. And given all the benefits that beaver bring, I think the burden of proof is on those that say it's a, of a detriment to uh, freshwater species. How's Thank that? You. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Chris, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, well, only on the micro scale, we've been doing it here um, uh, in relation to our uh, beaver work, and the uh, results have been really, really encouraging. Um, but what I would say, it, it would be nice to be doing this on a national basis, considering how badly, particularly the migratory fish, seem to be threatened by climate change and so on now. So it would be very interesting to have a, a, a national, a proper national research um, uh, programme on this. Uh, and, and try and really find out what's going on. Um, that's all I'd say. Thank you. Super. I think, can, can I just say one thing mm. other, just in terms of the, the migratory routes? You know, there are some concerns in some coordinates about the, the impact that um, beaver dams have on migratory fish. And as, you, as Matt says, the evidence is a bit mixed at the moment. But I think any impact that beavers might have pales into insignificance compared to all the artificial barriers that we've got across our rivers. So I think if we are going to focus on things, let's focus on removing those rather than, uh, we say, our ecosystem service engineers. Thank you. Great. Now to look at the Riverscapes partnership again and how um, we can work with farmers and land managers. There's a lovely question from Alana Bonita asking would that she'd like to know if there's a space for diversification of the income of the farm if space was then open to willow workers to tend the willow. Um, and it's it's sort of I think that's a can be applied generically as well, how could this offer diversification opportunities as we roll out the program um, and how and it relates to the question that we had as a panel in terms of how could the Riverscapes partnership support you, the land managers and farmers, what do you need from this partnership in order to make it a reality? Um, Richard, do you want to start thinking about that and the diversification? Yeah, and no, I think that's a, it's a great question, actually. Um, and I think one of the one of the things about the partnership is that we we do have a we have a way into UCO. Um, I mean, it's a it's a government grant. It has to have, you know, clear rules and how people apply. Um, and I think one of one of the um, uh, one of the things that we we can do as a as a partnership that have been funded and tasked to try and sell it is to look at where there might be um, challenges and barriers. And if one of those is around, you know, planting up um, willow willow areas and allowing that to be coppiced and managed, if that doesn't fit within the scheme. We, we have a we have a chance to influence that and um, yes it definitely should be you know woodlands are uh, are need to be managed and if they can be managed in a sustainable way and willow working is one of those then that's something we will definitely push for so I think it's a I think it's a really good question we're already we're already sort of into some of the nitty-gritty of how UCO is going to work in terms of um, you know the long-term management of the woodland that is created through the grant and it's a you know it's, it, it's a tricky thing but you know actually the the commission and, our, and others and we have a um, as you can imagine we have a, a huge panel on our steering group in including DEFRA and the arms and bodies, who, um, which, you know, in one way is a great thing because we've got, we've got their ear 
on this and we can make all of those points so we want they're the exactly the comments we want to hear we want to you know flush out the challenges that's that's what we're here to do really anyone else from the riverscapes crew have ideas on diversification i i think um this is real orfc bread and butter um you know we we want to see more people working in the landscape not fewer and mm -hmm. um uh, the trick is going to be how we how we create opportunities for people to to work in a meaningful at a meaningful scale uh w within within the sort of the the very variable landscape uh sorry land ownership scales that we have in this country um and uh uh th there's there's something else around this that that uh, strikes me and that is our actual models of land ownership or, or land rights are um, very, very 19th century. If we have a, uh, a model of more mosaic land rights rather than columnar land rights, um, it ought to make, uh, it conceptually it ought to make working across land holdings uh, by individuals pursuing small business opportunities that they, that they can um, uh, uh, accrue um, uh, uh, over the wider landscape, if that makes sense. Thank you. That's super. A uh, quick question for Richard. Where is the tree hub you mentioned in, in the chat? Can you put a... Um, I might pass that to Alex because he's closer to the... To uh, the it's not yeah, the uh, it's, uh, it's in development, shall we say. Um, I, will put, uh, uh, it's, I will put a link to its... Uh, I'm going to say ugly sister, but it's not an ugly sister. Uh, its sister product, uh, the Ag Hub, which we're developing as well in, in unison. I'll put that into the chat in a moment. But the Tree Hub, it's still in, under development. And I, to be honest, I think we're probably about nine weeks away before having it kind of for, properly up and running. Thank you. But watch this space. Right, a question on specific uh, location. Are there any plans for the drained fens in the east of England? Um, really interesting point generally for river buffers and, and, and floodplains. So um, who would like to start answering that one? Well, um, uh, this is a very, very uh, a complex issue. Uh, first of all, because uh, of the general sort of fertility and cultivatability of the land that we have there um, means that these landscapes tend to be very, very, very productive, both uh, in terms of gross food output, but also in, in, in uh, monetary value as well. So anything you do there needs to be done very consciously and um, uh, with absolute buy-in from, from, from the people who are living and working in those lands. Um, you know, although I think we probably know that ultimately they're all doomed in the next century or two by sea level rise, um, they are vital to our, um, uh, our survival currently. And uh, you know, interfering with those too much, I think you do so, do so very much at your risk. Uh, although ecologically, it might be uh, for the best. Thank you. That, that's super. Any, any additions from the panel? Um, we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to try and uh, roll through a few more questions, but do say if you've got contributions. Uh, a question on over abstraction of groundwater. What would the panelists do about this? Alex. Oh, that's a big question. Um, well, firstly, it should, well, I think that, that uh, what am I trying to say? There's a lot, un, there's a lot that's unknown about levels of groundwater. That's the first point. I think, you know, we don't have the full picture. Um, we do know that many places are going over abstracted. We should reduce abstraction if at all possible. And that's obviously the you know, part and parcel of the role of the EA and the licensing. Uh, but equally where we have those groundwater um, or aquifers, I think it's about looking at uh, relatively or kind of innovative approaches to how do we enable the recharge of those groundwater um, aquifers as quickly as possible. And in many instances, that would involve not planting trees on top of them, but it might be involved putting in various wetlands and other ways of capturing the water. So again, I think you know, it's often banded around term nature-based solutions, but actually really understanding the landscape and the catchment and how the water is used within that landscape 
then defines where that land use, what that land should be used for, or what, and then in what term, what value that land has. Because actually, if there is kind of, you know, yeah, uh, over abstraction of groundwater is a big issue and it will just get much, much worse. So we need to work out how we can start to recharge those aquifers as quickly as possible, recognizing that is a very long term um, challenge. Could that be something we build into the riverscapes consideration, or is it does, is it too complex to do that? Uh, it will be. It was certainly part and parcel of the, the the national modelling that we we're doing in terms of trying to come up with targeting maps, and we appreciate targeting maps have their limitations. But um, I have a colleague who's very good at this stuff, and he's pretty obsessed by groundwater and the fact that you don't want to put trees necessarily on top of those aquifers. So we will okay. reflect that. Just Thank you. Anyone else got a comment on that? Over abstraction. Okay, we have three minutes left. Um, I'm very conscious that we haven't answered two of the good questions about beavers, but I feel like probably um, this is this session is more about rivers, buffers, and riverscapes. Um, please do send any questions on beavers to info at beavertrust.org if you want to look at that more specifically. Um, I think we'll finish with the oh Richard, go on. Uh, well, sorry, I'll just gonna say just very quickly, there was a question about elms and the yeah. new schemes. And I think the answer to that is is hopefully and possibly because we still don't have all of the detail. But of course, you know, Elms has, will has got to factor into our plans, and we are very actively looking at the the, the new the two new schemes that have been I say launched, but we still don't have much detail on them. But they they could very likely factor in some of our plans. So sorry, just to answer that one. No, that's really helpful. Actually, the last question I was going to come to was, is there any, is the visual, cultural, physical impact of riparian tree planting in the views along the river being studied anywhere? Does anyone know a yes, no answer to that to start with? We've got one minute left. Yeah, we'll be doing a lot of that. Yeah, so we'll be trying to capture that aesthetic sort of, and I guess it's linked to heritage value as well. And what it, where those values come from, you know, do we yeah. do we see heritage? Do we see nature? Do we see what do we see in the landscape and how does that present opportunities, but also barriers for changing how that landscape looks? Really important, really important. Probably a lot more important than people realise, I think. Super. OK, oh, Richard, go on. Well, just just say something that we're very actively looking at, particularly in places like Cumbria with the World Heritage Site and in national parks. So the the um, cultural and landscape heritage is is definitely a factor that is is brought into this as well. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, I would second that. And you know, any talk around tree planting in the Lake District, it's it makes people nervous exactly because of the UNESCO status. So it's something we need to think about, not just on a sort of a subjective personal sort of level but on a sort of more political level we change the landscape you change a lot of things as a result part of which might be funding status and you know tourism what have you a really good point we could expand that couldn't we with a little more time i'm sorry we've got to end there um but we do because the channel needs to be um freed up for the next session so thank you very much to our panelists alex chris matt and richard and thank you all for joining us great to have a good audience and some great questions and just a little reminder that all the sessions will be recorded and shared on the orfc youtube channel so do share it widely if you've got um others you think would benefit from listening thanks very much thanks Bye, bye everyone bye thank you thank you everyone